Paula Greensmith is Chief Training Officer of the Black Women's Health Imperative, which bases its work on the fundamental question, what if all Black women and girls enjoyed optimal health and well-being in a socially just society? Paula and her husband, Philip Hamilton, are executives at the Urban Health Resource in Detroit, which promotes and provides community education, outreach, and affordable health care for uninsured and underinsured citizens. Paula and Philip contracted the virus, as you mentioned, about a year ago. They're here today to discuss their personal experiences and the inequitable toll the virus has taken on the Black community. Paula and Philip, welcome How you doing? How you doing? Thanks so much for joining us. So it's been several months since you contracted COVID. Are you still experiencing symptoms like what DL Hughley was just talking about earlier? Actually, yes, but very mild now. Um, the the one that I feel the most is a you know I have an arm pain that continues, and it's almost like every week I know that that's going to be here at some point. I I went through the brain fog. I was so happy to hear others mention that because I was really nervous. You know, I have a mother that had dementia before she passed last year. And so I started thinking, okay, gosh, is it dementia now? What else, you know, so it was really good to hear the the um, symptoms that others had just to kind of make us understand that it wasn't just us and, and it just kind of put things in perspective for us. But yeah, we're, overall we're great. And it was such an ordeal to go through that we feel great. Uh, and what we're feeling now is minuscule. Well, I'm so glad to hear that you're feeling much better. Um, we've also talked about and we've heard that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted the Black community. Mm -hmm. DL mentioned that himself and also mentioned the mistrust in the Black community too. Can mm -hmm. you help us understand what that looks like in real life? Well, you know, as DL mentioned, there, 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 there are so many people that remember the Tuskegee uh, experiment or have heard about it. And, um, you know, just the, the information, the changing information um, when we first contracted COVID and when it first hit our, our community, um, there was so much misinformation out there. I remember when we, we first, um, we had been traveling and we got back and found out um, that, you know, what was going on with it. And we, we were, we usually go and hang at this little jazz club every Friday night. And we got a call on a Friday night saying, Hey, are you, are you going to meet us up there at, at Baker's? And we said, you know, no, we're laying low um, because of that, the virus. And we had people to say, well, you know, black people aren't getting that. So it was so much, it's so much misinformation out there. And that compounded with the, the stuff that we know is real, the, the Tuskegee uh, experiment, the Henrietta Lacks uh, uh, story, a lot of people mistrust. And this, this whole COVID situation being so new and so different really compounded that mistrust in our community. So we were hearing that from a lot of people, that first of all, Black people don't get this. And then when they realized, yes, Black people do get this, then it was, you know, I don't trust the doctors. And, you know, a lot of us have doctors that are new um, in our communities and don't look like us and people don't trust the people that don't look like them. And so it, 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 we saw a lot of it. We still hear some of it and it's it's real. Right. I think and, last year we were traveling. So when it was occurring here, we didn't get to uh, see the fill effects till we got back uh, because we had some prominent people here that um, got sick and died we were traveling so we got back about the 13th uh and it was a friday as paula said and uh we didn't see that until that next week when we uh got That's sick it. yeah right and i think a lot of people were saying that they they didn't recognize it or acknowledge it until it impacted them but and i think you had mentioned before that there wasn't a week that went by that you didn't hear of someone that you knew who either got it or died from covid 19. Yeah, our community was hit so hard. Um, early in, was it March? It was, a, there were like three big events in March, early March, where like major, you know, players in our community, leaders, community um, personalities, there was a, a ballroom dance, you know, Detroit is a big ballroom dance community. And there was a big ballroom dance uh, program where a lot of people were infected. Then there was a, a police and pancakes prayer breakfast 
where a lot of people were affected. So we had our our police. We had a at one point there was like over 450 police officers in quarantine because there was a pancakes and was it pancakes and police <laughs> breakfast. So we saw not just our community members, our neighbors, our families, but we saw some of the most highest profile people in our community being affected by this. And we've had many people to die. I mean, some of our most uh, popular DJs, uh, our, our Wayne County Sheriff was a very, very popular politician here. Uh, just, it's just been, our, our community was ravaged by it. And, and it, was, it was really difficult. We, we had, like I said to you before, we didn't have a, a, a week um, until probably maybe August where we didn't hear of someone, whether it was a relative of someone or someone we knew personally to pass. And I think you just touched on a very important point, and Leslie Stahl mentioned it earlier, that we hear information, but really the most impactful information comes from the local community leaders. Mm -hmm. I think your, the Black Women's Health Imperative is really pivotal in that. Your roles as community leaders is pivotal in that. Could you help us understand what all that entails? Well, for one, our programs, our signature programs, all of our programs and our initiatives are around improving, advancing the health of Black women and girls throughout this nation. And you cannot improve the health of Black women and girls uh, without touching Black men, Black boys, our entire Black community. And so um, we actually, one of our other programs we run for the Black Women's Health Imperative through Urban Health Resource here is our uh, diabetes prevention program, Change Your Lifestyle, Change Your Life. And what's really great about that is because we're, we're typically very healthy people anyway, but because we run that program, we model what we preach in our program, what we promote in that program. And that program helps individuals to prevent diabetes and other um, chronic diseases by making lifestyle changes. Um, and so basically we, we help people to eat healthier. We help them to move more. We promote that through showing, you know, making, giving them full access to healthy ways of eating, um, healthy ways of moving, practical ways of eating and moving. And so because we're out in the community doing that already and we have groups throughout the community, that's something we do. That's something people that know us know we're going to always talk about. And so that helps us to, to get the word out and do what we're doing for Black Women's Health Imperative as well as Urban Health Resource here in Detroit. And, and has the Black Women's Health Imperative um, worked on COVID? And, and how has that conversation with your community changed in the last several months? Well, the Black Women's Health Imperatives has given us every opportunity. You know, we have opportunities here in Detroit to talk about it and to talk, to share our story and to talk to um, as many people as we can about why we think we were able to pull through it. Um, and we know that's our healthy lifestyle. You know, our program is an evidence-based CDC-led program. Um, so we are always able to talk about that with individuals. And so the Black Women's Health Imperative enables us to do that through Urban Health Resource. And then because of my role with them as well, uh, they have allowed me to have to be on platforms such as this. And anything that comes up, we're able to talk about it and share our stories. And, you know, because Black Women's Health Imperative is really by us and for us, uh, we know our communities. We know how to to talk to our people and to relate to our people and our people listen to us. We are trusted messengers and we know how to work with other trusted messengers to get the word out. And that's what it takes. I think everyone that's talked about this today has talked about the fact that you got to have trusted messengers, people that other people will listen to. And that's what's happening. And so uh, we just appreciate that opportunity because there's so much we have learned, even being healthy people, there's so much we've learned from this experience and just being able to have the platform and be a part of other platforms as the Black Women's Health Imperative has allowed us to, to do uh, has, has just been invaluable. It sounds like you've had great success. What are your key learnings that that you, you feel has helped you really build that trust and, and really get people engaged in this conversation? I think being real, being real people, doing real things. I mean, it's, it's one thing to have the experts come and talk, but real people listening to each other, you know, we're very social normally, you know, before COVID, it, there, there's not a week that we don't go out and, and you know, and socialize with others. And so <clears throat> being able to bring the message to people in a 
social environment, but in a lay person's way to just say, look, this stuff is real. You got to listen. This is evidence based. Listen to the science, you know, um, and, and helping people to understand the science. Don't you think being able to just be able to make it relatable yeah. and and always be willing to share that information, share our experiences and share with others what we have learned from our own personal experiences and, and try to help others with it. I, I, I like to say get healthy. That's one of the main things we, we work on in our pre-diabetic prevention, but we need to get people healthy. And that's what one of our mission after we recovered from that. Yeah. I love Thank that. You. That's a practical ways to get healthy. You know, if you tell people you got to get healthy, you got to go lose all this weight. Yeah, we want you to lose five to seven percent of your body weight to start preventing diabetes and start working up. But do those baby steps. You know, there are so many little things you can do. And that's, you know, what we've been able to do and to talk to others about. And that's one of the benefits of, pan of this pandemic. I think a lot more people are, are getting healthier. I love Paul that. Is. That's exactly what we do at Healthline too, is mm -hmm. talk about the evidence, but also make it very relatable and actionable for the individual so that they can know how to make the best decisions for themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul and Philip, Steve Swayze here. Uh, I've enjoyed hearing your comments clearly about the, the need for local localized trust. When we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you had mentioned to me that uh, right after the baseball great Hank Aaron passed away, uh, the black community spread uh, information that it was because he took the vaccine. Uh, has that has that rumor squashed and is it or is it still prevalent? It, I think it was short lived, um, you know, because at that point, the vaccines were new, um, were newer. And, you know, when people don't have full information, you know, they'll create information. Um, and then there was a lot of misinformation out there on the internet, you know, on Facebook and so forth. Um, but I think that, again, hearing from ministers, hearing from, um, you know, prominent doctors, you know, prominent celebrities, just hearing from so many others has really helped with that. So it, I think that that was a big roar at first, but I was surprised at how quickly that that dissipated. And I think people want to help. I yeah. think the vaccine and hope, and I think that presented an opportunity for them to get that. And so we, most of our people that we're in surrounding with is getting it or trying to get it or have uh, taken it. And yeah. um, that's one reason. It's interesting. I, we were, at, I think I told you, we were at opposite ends of the spectrum. Philip was gung ho right away, gonna get it, ready to go. And I was, nah, we're gonna wait. I'm gonna wait it out and see, but you know, I don't, I don't try new beverages first. I'm going to wait. I'm going to be the last one to try everything. But um, I am surprised at how many people are on board with it and are encouraging others, even friends that I'm usually saying, we got to be healthy. We got to do this. We got to do everything to stay healthy. I have friends calling me up saying, have you decided? Let me tell you why you need to decide to do it. So it's, it's coming around. It's coming around. And I think there are more people that want it and are waiting to get it than I hear of um, that don't want to do it now. I, I, one of the reasons I, I wanted to get it, was besides for myself, is to uh, convince her to get it, my wife, <laughs> to get it, because I know we're kind of resistant because we talked about it and I know she's not up for trying new medicine or she hates the, any type of medicine. So I knew that and I wanted to prove to her and to others to get it, yeah. yeah. I, I'm pleased you're speaking with yourselves. Um, Philip and Paula, thank you for joining us today. Han, any last thoughts for Philip and Paula? Well, I, you know, I think I think you perfectly encapsulated it. It's that co constant question of what is the evidence, what's the science, and if we start to see the positive signs, then why don't we do it for ourselves, but then for others in our community to protect each other? Yeah. Philip and Paula, it's been such a pleasure and an honor to speak with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. For thank you. Us. Right. We appreciate, it. We appreciate the opportunity. If we can help, we're going to do it. Thank yeah. you.